I want to go back now and take another look at the chem. <clears throat> I want to spend a few minutes to dig a little bit deeper into um, our actual flywheel device and go into some more detail about how this machine works. <clears throat> Again, the inner rotor, the green part, that, that is the actual flywheel. Okay? That is the, uh, the part of the machine that's spinning at a high rate of speed with a heavy mass that is going to be your mechanical energy storage. And when you're in normal operation, the way that we spin that machine is with a, a pony motor that sits on the right side end of that machine, um, in this case. So we actually will uh, control this pony motor with a, a variable frequency drive, which is in our USP panel. Uh, we'll go into the, all the panels here in, in a few uh, follow-up presentations. But uh, the USP panel contains a a variable uh, speed drive, frequency drive, that is going to uh, source into this pony motor. Okay, so it's a basically a uh, a three-phase uh, motor machine fed by our VFD that is going to turn the inner rotor and maintain its speed at about 4,200 RPM. Um, that pony motor is fed from the output of our system. So from, if you look at the choke and the Q2 breaker, that is what the power feed, uh, where it comes from to feed our VFD. So it's, it's part of the critical power output that spins this inner rotor, okay? And it's gonna spin, in your case, uh, the inner rotor at about 4,200 RPM. You'll actually see on the uh, UCP, there's a readout for your uh, inner rotor speed. It's actually going to be about 4196, 4197. There's a little, little bit of slip there. But basically, it's going to be 4200 RPM kept up to speed by the pony motor that is being driven by our VFD. And that's how the unit's going to stay in its normal operating state. Okay. Um, it's free spinning, again, on its own bearings. No other influence on that inner rotor when it's in that mode of operation. Again, your yellow part is your shaft connected part, which is connected to your alternator, which at this point in normal operation is being motored at 1800 RPM. So your shaft, your yellow portion is gonna be spinning at 1800 RPM, and your green portion is spinning at 4200 RPM. Okay, that's normal operation. There are a set of DC windings uh, attached to this outer rotor. You can see them here these are your DC windings. And those are gonna be, uh, in this mode of operation, inert. They're not gonna be, they're not gonna be energized. There's not gonna be any, any current going through those DC windings. But when it comes time to extract the energy from the uh, inner rotor, that's when these DC windings will come into play. And those DC windings are basically gonna be fed by this part of the machine, which is our uh, exciter for our DC windings. Uh, also in our USP, we have a, a small um, uh, rectifier unit that feeds a small amount of DC into the field windings of this exciter. And then through a, uh, a process of rectification within this exciter, it will then send DC current into these DC windings of the outer rotor. So it's, it works much like uh, a regular uh, exciter would on an, on an alternator, where you have an initial DC source that just feeds uh, excitation field windings, and that is then used to generate uh, or magnify into a DC current that flows from the exciter into these DC windings, okay? Now, when we want to extract the energy from the inner rotor of this, of this uh, chem device, um, it's gonna happen uh, through a process of, of doing two things at once, basically. When we are ready to extract the, the energy, in other words, we've disconnected from utility, we've opened the Q1 breaker, we've started the diesel, it's, it's coming up to speed. The third part of that equation was energizing DC windings. 
But when we energize the DC windings, first we're going to stop the, the pony motor. Okay, we don't want to have the pony motor have to act or fight against extracting the energy from the inner rotor. So the pony motor is going to be told to stop. And then at the same time, we're going to energize those DC windings through our exciter machine. And what happens when you basically start putting current through these DC windings is it's going to generate that magnetic field that's going to magnetically grab on to the, um, the flywheel portion or the green portion or the inner rotor of that, of that machine. So you can imagine this very heavy mass, this green mass spinning at a high rate of speed, all of a sudden being acted upon by a, a magnet that's being all of a sudden created through the energization of these DC windings. So basically, a north and south pole grabbing onto an inner rotor magnetically, and that inner rotor is now going to want to magnetically grab on, and it's going to want to turn that outer rotor as a, as a prime mover. Okay, And there's going to be a lot of slip there, uh, obviously, because you don't want it to hard grab onto that inner rotor, because that inner rotor is spinning at 4,200 RPM, and if you hard grabbed onto it, you would probably break the shaft, right? Um, but it's going to be kind of a gradual grabbing on of that inner rotor to the outer rotor magnetically, and that inner rotor is going to start then turning the outer rotor, serving as a, as a prime mover, so to speak, maintaining the outer rotor at 1800 RPM. Okay. Now initially, uh, the grab of DC is going to be at a, at a certain level. Okay, uh, the amount of current needed to energize these windings to develop that magnetic field to grab on is going to be at a at a certain level initially. But as you extract energy from the inner rotor, the green part, um, to maintain the shaft speed of 1800 RPM, it's it's going to start to slow down. That inner rotor is going to start to to give up some of its speed and slow down. Well, if the inner rotor is slowing down. Uh, as it's trying to turn the outer rotor, what keeps the outer rotor from slowing down as well? Well, we regulate the outer rotor to 1800 RPM by increasing the amount of DC that we run through these windings. So as the inner rotor is slowing down, we just have to increase the amount of DC current to strengthen that magnetic field so that regardless of the speed of the inner rotor, we can just maintain the outer rotor at 1800 RPM. How so long it, will it take for them both to get to 1800 RPM? Um, well, first of all, you never want them both to get to 1800 RPM. Because if that happens, it means you've, that would be the end of, now the you've, end of you have no more energy. You can't, you can't transfer energy anymore. So you, the inner rotor always has to be above 1800 RPM to be able to transfer its energy to the outer rotor. Right. Um, so it's never going to get to 1800 RPM. Um, unless you shut the machine down, of course. How long can it live off 4,200 RPM? It's basically, um, we go by the output specification. So if we want the output to stay within 1.5% of 60 hertz, which is our output specification, then the answer is how long does it take before the frequency falls below that 1.5% set point, right? And um, remember that when the diesel comes up to speed, it clutches in in around two or three seconds. And then it starts to, to provide power. And then it's sharing with the, with the cam a little bit until the turbos kick in on the diesel. And then the cam is, is done. Um, if the diesel were not there, if it, if it had to be just the cam piece um, to uh, provide for full load, um, it would, uh, at the rating of your system, it would probably last about six to seven seconds. Okay, so after about six to seven seconds, you would fall outside of that 1.5%. Okay. Um, and we've actually run tests at the factory where we've done that, you know, to see exactly how much energy is available, you know, for our chems. But that's what it turns out to be. Now, that's at full load. If you're at half load, then you don't 
you know, you can last a lot longer because right. it's it's a it's an energy time relationship. Um, if you're at half load, you might last up to 10, 12 seconds, and it, it, it typically follows more of a linear type of type of arrangement there. But yeah, I would say anywhere from six to seven seconds at full load, if the diesel, you know, isn't running. Um, but because our diesel starts within two seconds, it gives us plenty of time, you know, to bridge that gap. In fact, um, if for some reason the diesel doesn't start the first time around, we can usually give it a, another crank and you're still going to be okay as long as it starts within about four or five seconds. Okay. So again, as the inner rotor starts to spin down because we're using the energy in it, we just grab harder onto it with our, our excitation and magnetic current and so that we can always maintain the output of 60 hertz because the shaft will be maintained at 1800 RPM. Okay. So that's, that's how that works. That's how we're able to stay and regulate to 60 hertz at the output, even though our flywheel is starting to spin down. Okay. And again, it's uh, the amount of energy that is taken from the flywheel is going to depend on your load, how loaded you are, whether it's full load or half load or quarter load. Um, and you can actually see on our plots, because we will plot um, the slowdown of the inner rotor you know, during an outage, for example. We did this during our, our site acceptance tests. And you can see exactly how much energy is given up by the flywheel based on you know, how much speed um, is decreased throughout the process. Um, now, when the diesel kicks in, uh, and, and after the turbos have, have fully uh, provided uh, for the load and the diesel has it all by itself, then we'll stop the DC uh, injection and we'll start to recharge uh, the flywheel using the pony motor again. So we'll get it back up to 4,200 RPM. Okay. Question is, Yes, it, it's all driven. Yeah, the question is, uh, you know, I guess the question is, the PLC regulates the process. It, it basically controls, yeah, your PLC controls everything. Um, uh, the PLC controls uh, your circuit breakers when they open and close. It controls the starting of your diesel. It controls the uh, extraction of energy from your chem, uh, whether it's uh, DC, uh, being provided or whether it's the pony motor uh, that is recharging the, the uh, flywheel. This is all, all PLC driven and it's all fully automatic. Um, one thing to kind of get out of the system is it's, it's designed uh, such that it requires really little to no operator interaction at all. Uh, it's, it's, it's fully automatic. Um, you don't have to be around the machine. It, it, it does its thing on its own. It, it's looking at utility. It knows when to um, uh, basically open the input breaker and remove itself from utility. It knows when to go back to utility. And it does all of that automatically. If there happens to be a, 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 a failure condition where it has to shut itself down, it will do that. It will send itself to bypass. Um, what it will not do, obviously, is it will not return itself from bypass. That has to be an operator action. It can't start itself from a stop. You have to be there to actually turn on the machine. Um, but other than that, it's designed to be completely automatic. And not only that, but it has certain safeties built into the system such that you as an operator really can't do anything that would harm the system. Um, any command that you give the, uh, the unit goes through the PLC. And when you tell the unit to go to bypass, for example, uh, you're not controlling the bypass itself. You're making a request to the PLC, I'd like to go to bypass. And if the PLC doesn't see a condition where it can do that safely, it won't do it. So your commands to the unit are basically uh, requests, not so much orders. 
and the PLC will not do anything that is, in its mind, uh, an unsafe condition. Okay, uh, and that even goes for operating the breakers. Um, now you can, you can remotely open any breaker you want, and 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 there's a process by which you can do that, and I'll show that to you. But you cannot close a breaker uh, on your own in any way or fashion or form unless the machine allows that to happen. Okay, because there are safety checks and sync checks and, and all these things are, are going on inside the PLC to make sure that any action that it controls is a safe action. Okay. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Maybe a little bit before you can tell me anyway. So you said that we have to be the one to start. So let's say this whole process just started. The diesel's up, Q2 is shut, Q1 is open, diesel's mm -hmm. running. Q1 closes. Q2 yeah. So we have continuous closing. Right. We shut the diesel down? Is that no. What you're just saying? So the diesel will shut down on its own. The diesel will shut down on its own. Yeah. 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 Let's uh in fact let's let's revisit that a little bit here. We can go through the whole process. I'm just I'm just thinking <coughs> the diesel side of it, that's all. Right. Let's let me just take you uh, again uh, through the whole process of a of a transfer to diesel and back. So again, we start in utility mode, and we are monitoring the utility at all times, all three phases for voltage, frequency, um, uh, imbalances, you know, rapid phase shifts, um, and we're monitoring that all the time. The utility goes outside of our specifications, and it can be, it can be a voltage dip in excess of 10%. It can be a complete, an utter disappearance of voltage but our system will obviously then go into diesel operation so again it'll open the Q1 breaker it'll start the diesel it'll start extracting energy from the flywheel um, and then ultimately the diesel will then have the load at that point and now you're operating in, in basically a gen set mode or what we call uh, sometimes emergency mode but your input breaker is open your diesel is running it's now providing all your power your flywheel is back up and charged again and we're still continuing to monitor the utility so when the utility comes back within our specifications and there's a bit of a hysteresis there you know for example let's say rejection of voltage on the utility side is plus or minus 10 percent to reaccept the utility we have to be within plus or minus eight percent for example so there's a little hysteresis there okay but when the utility comes back and we see it and it is within our acceptance criteria then we're going to start the process of going back to the utility and this is fully automatic uh, as well now, we're not going to go back to utility right away, okay? And there's a couple reasons why. Um, and this gets into what we call our mains acceptance time, okay? We don't want to come back to a utility that's not stable. So let's say you have an outage. Um, typically, outages don't last all that long. You know, it might even be a couple seconds at, at most. But the utility comes back after two seconds. We're not going to go back to utility right away because we don't know if the utility is stable yet. It might be coming in and out. And we don't want to go back to a utility that's just going to be rejected again. So we have what's called our mains acceptance time. And for your unit, it's in about 15 to 20 minutes. So we have to see utility come back within our acceptance criteria, and we have to see it be stable for about 15 or 20 minutes and only when we know that it's stable are we going to go back to it now there's another reason why that MAT uh, number is a good thing as well um, not just because it lets us know utility is stable but also we might need some time to recharge our induction coupling fully because if you were at full load and you had a transition to diesel um, we might have used all of the energy or all of the usable energy in our chem. So before we go back to utility, we want to make sure we have a nice fully charged flywheel again. 
Because if we went to utility too quickly and then we had another outage, we wouldn't have enough energy in our chem to withstand that second transition. So the MAT is not just to ensure we have a stable utility, but it's also to make sure that all the energy that, we, that was depleted from our flywheel gets reinserted or recharged. And we know that it takes about 15 minutes or so to go from a depleted state to a fully charged state on our flywheel. You know, it takes about 15 minutes to get from, you know, 2200 RPM to 4200 RPM, for example, okay? So the MAT time is something that you have to wait through even when utility comes back. But once utility comes back and we've met our MAT time of 15 or 20 minutes, then we will go ahead and transition back to utility. Now, that whole time that utility is available, we will be synchronized to it, okay? So if there's no utility, we're running our diesel, it's running on its own internal frequency setting, maintaining its own output at 60 hertz. But when the utility comes back, we're gonna start synchronizing back to utility. We're actually gonna synchronize to it and run in synchronous with utility so that we're able to close Q1 when we're ready to. All right, so utility comes back, we're synchronizing to it, we're running in sync with it, um, and we're waiting out the MAT. And then once the MAT timer goes to zero, we're gonna give a command for the Q1 breaker to close. The, the PLC is gonna command the breaker to close. And so the Q1 breaker will then close, and now we're back in normal operation. Now the utility is servicing the load again through our synchronous condenser function. Our, our, our clutch here will then disengage. Because get a command for fuel to stop the diesel? Not right away, but what we will do is we'll tell the diesel to go to idle speed. Okay. So, so as soon as, down, yeah, right. As soon as the Q1 breaker closes, we're gonna command our diesel to drop to 1750 RPM. That will disengage the clutch because now our diesel is running slower than our alternator, which means the clutch will disengage. And then we're gonna run the diesel at idle speed for another three minutes or so. That's just for cool down. Right. Correct. Right, and then it'll, it'll tell the diesel to stop and the diesel will come to a stop and it'll be ready for its next start, okay? Now, the way that we actually tell the diesel to stop is we take away the ignition, okay? Normally, the ignition is always applied to the diesel when it's in a state of standby. And there are other things that we do th to the diesel to make sure, to ensure that it's going to start properly when it needs to. Uh, one thing we're doing is we're constantly preheating the diesel. There's a, there's a preheat on the front end of the engine that uh, maintains the, the water temperature uh, in the diesel to a certain temperature to, to maintain heat in the engine. So we keep it preheated. We also have a pre-loop pump on the diesel that we run uh, on a cycle to make sure that the uh, diesel is always lubricated. And um, if you haven't already, you'll, you'll hear this pump, it's, it's pretty loud. Ever so often it'll come on and run, it's, it's a loud pump, it's just forcing some lubrication through the diesel to keep it lubricated. So we keep the diesel preheated, we keep it pre-lubricated so that when we do want it to start, it starts very quickly. That's a part of the process of getting it to start quickly. Does that move the turbos as well then? Does the lubrication go through? Does it tie into the turbo? No, it does not. No. I, I don't believe the pre-loop system ties into the turbos. I don't believe so. I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't think so. Um, so, again, the ignition signal is always applied for the diesel and all it's waiting for is for the start motors to start spinning the flywheel to start it up fire it up and get it up to speed in about two or three seconds uh, when we want to stop the diesel though we just we take away the ignition signal briefly taking away the ignition will stop the diesel and once it's stopped then we reapply ignition to get it ready for the next start okay but really the only thing that we need to do to start the diesel is just get those start motors active to turn the flywheel Okay. Um, 
but the, key, the, the, the diesel does go down through a, a, a three minute cooling period and then, and then the, the PLC will shut it off. So all of that process, opening Q1, starting diesel, uh, releasing energy through DC injection uh, to resyncing to the utility, closing Q1, stopping the diesel, that's all done by the PLC automatically. It takes no operator interaction whatsoever. Okay, fully automatic. Um, the other thing about starting the diesel, and then we'll take a break after this uh, last, last, last point here, is um, we start our diesel um, not through our diesel start batteries. Now we do have diesel start batteries, but they're basically there for a first start operation. In other words, when there is, when the machine is completely down and not generating any power, we will start the machine first by starting the diesel to get power generated to kick off the system. That is done using the diesel start batteries, just like a normal diesel you know, start battery system would work. But once we are operating and generating power through our alternator, we don't have to start the diesel with the, with the batteries anymore because we have what we call an RSP system or a redundant start panel, which is a box that contains a rectifier that we can send 24 volts directly into the start motors being fed or sourced from the output of our system. So three phase AC going to a rectifier into DC, which is fed right to the start motors of the diesel. So when we start our diesel from an outage, um, from normal operation of diesel, we're actually using the RSP and not using the batteries. Okay, so again, another item that helps you know start the diesel quickly uh, is the RSP system and also keep in mind that starting our diesel and going from normal to diesel operation is a little bit different than starting a regular genset right because if you were to start a genset like a standby genset uh, when you start the diesel there's no clutch here you're basically shaft connected to an alternator and not only do you have to uh, start the diesel, but you have to overcome um, uh, the frictions and the weight of the inner rotor of the, of the alternator as well to bring that diesel up to a operating speed. That's a mechanical load that is on the diesel from the get-go once you try and start that diesel. With our diesel, because we're already spinning the shaft and we're not coupled via this uh, clutch that's not engaged, we have no mechanical load on the diesel whatsoever when we start it. So it doesn't have to overcome the weight of the shaft or the inner rotor of the alternator to start the diesel to get it up to 1800 RPM. So another reason why it comes up so quickly is because there's, there's no mechanical load on it whatsoever. So all those things combined, preheating, pre-lubing, we're not mechanically connected here. We've got an RSP system. That all brings that diesel up from zero to 1800 very, very quickly. Um, therefore, you know, we only have to a couple seconds worth of being on flywheel during the transition. Okay. A lot of people that aren't familiar with our system can't believe the diesel starts that quickly. And then we show it to them. And it's, uh, yeah, it but, sounded pretty quick to me. When yeah. You first said that, but it makes sense now. Yeah. Now we can only use certain engines. We, uh, we use Cummins. Um, we used to use MTU, but now they belong to our competitor, so we don't use MTU anymore. But um, we use Cummins, we use Mitsubishi, uh, and we can use those engines because they are also inherently quick starting. We cannot use CAT engines because the flywheel is way too heavy and, and they start too slowly. So we don't use CAT engines, but we specifically tune our, our engines that we do use you know, for quick starting. 